Andrea Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in learning more about tech and how to turn your side hustle into your main hustle, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest was the first student at his college to land an internship at Google and then got a full-time offer post-grad. But before I introduce you to Jerry Lee, who today is the co-founder and COO of One Sultan, a company whose mission it is to turn underdogs into winners. I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's newsletter that gives you tips, tricks, and insights into all kinds of careers and industries from the professionals like Jerry who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org and the sign up box is right there. Now my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Jerry Lee, the co-founder and chief operating officer of One Sulting a company focused on helping those who come from non-target schools with non-traditional backgrounds to get into their dream careers. To date, Juan Sulting has helped thousands of job seekers receive offers from top companies, including the Googles, Deloitte's, and Goldman Sachs's of the world. Juan Sulting started off as a side hustle for Jerry and his partner, Jonathan Javier, while they were working inside big tech firms like Google and Cisco and and all of the others because they wanted to help others like them who didn't go to big name schools that attracted all the big name companies that showed up on campus to recruit. Jerry spent three years at Google before he moved to Lucid, where he became the youngest person to lead a project strategy team there. By the way, Lucid is only 11 years old as of 2021, and it was actually started by two young guys, kind of like Jerry and Jonathan, helping teams look to and innovate for the future. After spending a year at Lucid as manager of project strategy and analytics, Jerry joined Jonathan and went all in on one salting. It's been about a year. We're doing this interview now in September of 2021. They went all in in the fall of 2020, and it has been growing by leaps and bounds ever since. Jerry has also been named a 2020 top LinkedIn voice on tech, and he has, gosh, he has about 150,000 followers on LinkedIn and tens of thousands of followers on IG and TikTok. Jerry, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you still caffeinated on life and ready to go? Andrea, I just had my sip of water, so I am ready to go and so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure. And I still love you, Jerry, even if you don't drink coffee. You know, it's one of those things like I feel an extra special bond with my guests who are Java junkies. But, you know, when someone is naturally caffeinated like you, I make big exceptions. I love it. I'll promise to bring that same level of energy. So before we get into what you're doing now at One Sulting and how you and Jonathan have built it up in just two short years to the point where you're both now all in, I was thinking we could 
flashback to when you were still in undergrad, which actually wasn't that long ago. I think you graduated, was it in 2017? 2017, that's right. Yeah. So you were a freshman in 2013? That's right. All right. And you went to Babson College in Massachusetts. You were, and you've written about this on LinkedIn, you were actually applying for internships already when you were a freshman, which I think is really impressive in and of itself. Did you have any particular kinds of internships that you were looking to land? I actually listened to another podcast interview that you did uh, maybe a year or two ago. And you talked about how you took accounting as a freshman and you were like, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. So were you looking for accounting internships? Yeah, it's so funny that you're bringing that up because I remember I had done so well in my accounting class. I'm like, this is absolutely my passion. And I remember I went to a big accounting firm's office and it was just silent as a library. And I was like, my goodness, I, I am not cut out for this. But as I was sort of thinking about internships my freshman year, I did what I call the spray and pray. I applied to as many jobs and full-time job, junior year at internships, freshman year at internships as I possibly could find because I felt, hey, you know what? I'm going to let the market decide for me. And unfortunately so, I probably sent about 200, 300 that year and got nothing in response. Seriously? (laughs) There was crickets. Nothing. And at that point, I had nothing on my resume my resume was maybe two or three pages of just high school experience. So I totally understand why companies would not have wanted to hire freshman year, Jerry, but sophomore years where everything sort of kicked off for me. You actually wrote a post on LinkedIn the other day that said, in my first year of college, I thought to myself, I am so far behind everyone. People landed internships at EY, McKinsey and Company, And I just got rejected from an on-campus job. My parents didn't know how to help, so they would send me huge care packages, boxes of microwavable rice, ramen, and individually wrapped seaweed. So I had to look elsewhere. First of all, that is so unbelievably sweet that they did that. And this is, we're going to continue with the post here. I sought advice from a mentor of mine, and she told me, Jerry, the fact that we're having this conversation tells me you'll be fine. Though I didn't know it at the time, what she was trying to say was that if I cared enough and gave it enough time and and attention, then I would eventually figure it out. I look back at this memory and laugh because what she said was true. Absolutely right. And as you were reading that post, it made me think back to that exact moment where the first on-campus job that I was so excited about It was an IT specialist role where you were sort of working with computers and helping people debug problems. And I was like, oh, I'm pretty savvy with tech. And I interviewed, remember, I didn't wear wear a button down. I wore a t-shirt and jeans. And I thought to myself, well, if I just tuck my shirt in, maybe it'll look more professional. (laughs) So I I laugh at those memories. And yeah, that, that mentor at the time, I just, that always just stuck with me. I don't know why, but that one conversation just stuck with me. And every time I get a chance to talk to someone who just has that same level, if not more ambition and drive, I'm just like, you'll be okay. Like you are going to figure this out. And it's it's probably at the time I was like, that is the worst advice. But looking back on it, I'm like, that is everything. So tease that out a little bit, Jerry. Why do you want our young listeners who may be going through this right now to know that they're going to be okay. Like, why is that not a blow off? The reason why that's not a blow off is that what I've learned getting rejected so many times and asking so many people for advice is that every moment that you take action, whether you apply to a job, you reach out to someone for help, you're you might learn something that's so small, but it might make you do an action differently. It might allow you to think about something differently. You're going to pursue that path for a week. Then you'll have another another learning 
You're going to then adapt, use that learning to adapt, so on and so forth. And by the time you look back at your past year, you're going to go, holy moly, I cannot believe I was thinking about these problems in that way a year ago. And it's only going to continue compounding year after year. And I remember I saw this one post where it said, if you strive to be 1% better every day, after a year, you're going to be better by 23 fold or or something, a large number like that. I think that comes from James Clear. Do you know who James is? He He sounds familiar. He's the guy who wrote, oh my gosh, I have it. Oh, Atomic Habits. Yes, exactly right. So that principle to me is how I've sort of incorporated that in my learning and my career. Yeah, I totally get that. And I also want our young listeners to know that they are exactly where they should be right now. None of us had the wisdom that you are expecting yourself to have right now. And the more that you put yourself out there, the more that you reach out to have an informational interview, to grab a coffee with somebody and ask them to help you out with one thing or another, the more you are going to incrementally get wiser and learn. And that is why I can say, listening to the advice that Jerry got, I totally get it because he was a go-getter. He is a go-getter, somebody who was putting himself out there trying to learn. And as long as you are doing the same thing, you are going to figure it out too. Yeah. And I remember growing up, there was a program in my elementary school called the Gates Program. It was gifted and talented students. And I didn't get in. A lot of my friends did. And I thought to myself, man, I am the dumbest guy around. And to this day, I don't think that I am born with some naturally large brain or I think about things in a different way. Absolutely not. I if any, I think I am the most average person that you'll meet. If there's anything that I feel like I have an edge over my competition is that if there's something that I want to achieve, I will not stop, not nonstop thinking about it. I won't stop talking to people about it. I won't stop learning about it. To me, I feel like that is significantly more important than anything that you might be born with. I love that, Jerry. I'm giving you a double high five, my friend, because I feel the same way. I am not one iota smarter than any other person out there. I am sure I have an average intellect. But what I do have is a whole lot of grit, and I am going to do whatever it takes to get it done. And as long as you adopt that mindset, you will too. So I want to ask you, Jerry, what did you learn between freshman year and junior year when you became the first Babson student to land an internship at Google? The biggest thing I've learned is that, simply put, the job search is really a function of two variables. It's the amount of time that you put in and the amount of effort that you put in. If you can optimize for those two variables where you might be working on your resume for a day, that's a function of time. The level of effort is taking that resume, going to a recruiter and saying, hey, listen, I'm here because I love your feedback. If you can give me a 10 second glance and tell me one thing that I can change, that would be, that would make my day. I'm happy to buy you a cup of coffee, something along those lines. And as I've sort of gotten deeper into the job search, what I've realized is that tying back into what we were talking about earlier, being 1% better every day, that is, that is honestly it. There is a formula to having a stellar resume that this is a formula for having a great interview. And the more time that you spend into it, the more effort you put into it, the easier it becomes. Can you give us just a couple of tidbits? I know you teach this at One Salting, but just a couple of tidbits on the resume side and on the interviewing side that our young listeners could put into practice. Absolutely. So one is making sure that you have a resume template that is 
legible and is sort of a quote unquote boring resume template, unless you're trying to go into design. The reason why you want to have a sort of boring template is because on average, recruiters will spend about six seconds on your resume. So you want to make sure none of those seconds are trying to are spent the recruiter trying to figure out where information is. You want it to be easily digestible as possible. Tip number two, make sure that your bullet points have numbers in them. And when I say numbers, it means don't have a bullet point that says create an event with another team or with another organization. Rather say created a technology industry spotlight event where we collaborated with six technology companies and this brought in 150 attendees. You might have done the same thing, but you're selling yourself in the second. And last thing about resumes is one of the hacks that we try and teach is look through a job description that you are so passionate about. And you're like, this is the role that I want. Then look at your resume. If the response, if the bullet points on the responsibility section don't line up to the bullet points on your resume, then that should tell yourself one of two things. One, maybe you're not focusing on the right experiences or two, you need to go out and make those experiences. And experiences don't always have to be internships, projects, classwork, even just starting a t-shirt business because you just want to know how accounting works. All that stuff is fair game. Yeah, those side hustles are key. Tell us about the internship. Was this a summer internship or was it during the school year? So this Google internship was a 12-week program in the summer where you worked full-time and you were integrated into a team. So the team that I was integrated in was Trust and Safety AdWords, where we specifically focused on how do we use machine learning and AI to find bad actors in the platform. So my internship consisted of two main skills that I learned. One is heavy data analytics really digging through data, trying to find insights there. And the second is really project management. I got the opportunity to work across three countries, across four teams. And so you needed to make sure your ducks were in line because there were always so many moving pieces. I want to ask you in a second how you parlayed that internship to get the full-time gig when you graduated. But before I do, can you talk about the letter that you wrote Google that you believe helped you land that internship in the first place? You know, it's so funny because I wish I had a sexy story. I wish I could say, you know, I taught, I reached out to six recruiters and I got three referrals and the VP knew me, absolutely nothing. I remember the only thing I submitted was my resume and cover letter. And I believe they asked you a a short form question of, what is your favorite Google product? And And I remember I wrote, Google Calendar because I managed my life with it. I wrote that because I was like, I have no chance. At the time, I felt like I had no chance of getting in. And as I look back on it, and as I was talking to the other interns in the cohort, the main thing that people had throughout the the hundreds, one schools that were represented in our intern class, two things. One, each and every single one of them were leaders on their campus. So they were running their consulting organization. They were running their tech organization. They were running their volunteer organization. And the second and most important thing I found is that every single one of them had spent so much time and effort into their jobs or strategy, their resume, their interview, their uh, application, so much time spending on it that when you looked at our resume side by side, you'll almost think, wow, these things are sort of identical. Wow. So you don't think what you put in your letter made a difference? To be honest, I don't think it did. I think the biggest thing was just my resume. Okay. (laughs) The reason I was asking is that you have that as one of your featured items on your LinkedIn page. And when I tried to read it, it's like making me subscribe to Business Insider. (laughs) And so I wasn't able... To read the article, I thought maybe there was something in there. Okay, fair (laughs) enough. So I think sometimes we don't talk enough about what we do to set ourselves apart while we're in an internship. I am guessing, Jerry, that you went above and beyond 
during the summer, those 12 weeks that you spent at Google. Can you give us a little window into how you set yourself apart? There were three things that I did very intentionally that I felt like sort of helped me put myself in a better position to get a full-time offer. The first is I very, very, from the very beginning, outlined exactly what are my expectations for this role? Is it to just deliver this project? Is it to do other things? Like what manager, please tell me what the success looked like. And he said, you know what? We're going to have a 12 week project. If you can kill it in that project, you're going to be good. And so I said, cool. Then I, what I did after that was I created a project plan to say, for me to get to this end goal of this 12 week project, this is what it's going to look like week by week. This is what our check-ins are going to look like. And at these check-ins, this is, I hope to get a lot of your input so that I can make sure I can land that goal. Who are you talking to? My manager at the time. Oh, okay. Got it. That's right. The second thing that I did was during those 12 weeks, I very intentionally made sure I became acquaintances, if not friends with everyone on the team. I want to make sure that not only did they believe, yeah, Jerry can do the work, but also he is someone that I could see myself working with and I would be excited to work with him. So I would set up time to do team lunches, individual lunches. More importantly, one thing that I did was I created a spreadsheet of every person's um, name on my team. And then every time they said something about themselves that was sort of unique, I would write that write it down on a spreadsheet so that I would never forget. And I made sure each and every single one of those people, I at least sent them an article, a picture, a recommendation of something that they liked, just as sort of like a courtesy thing, at least once. And the last thing I did was I made sure that I told my intern recruiter, my manager, and my team that I wanted to come back, that I was excited to come back, that the work was exciting. And, you know, it sort of might be, most people might think, well, I'm, I'm doing this internship. I mean, it's sort of implied, right? You know, being as 100% clear that there is no doubt in their mind that I would come back if they gave me that offer is something I did not want them to even have a single question about. So those are the three things that I tried to do. Amazing. And I'm also guessing, Jerry, that you were, if you weren't the first person in the office in the morning, you were one of the first people in and maybe one of the last out, or am I, am I way off base? I definitely tried to do that on day one. I remember I arrived at the office at 7.30 a.m. The average time the team would arrive to the office was 9 a.m., So I was just confused and I was lost and I didn't know what to do for the next hour and a half because it was my first day in the office. So but after that, I said, you know what, I'm going to come in 30 minutes earlier and leave when there are only a couple people left. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Did you really want to work there because you enjoyed the work or just because you had your heart set on Google? I think 80% of it was a former and 20% of it was a latter. My sort of five-year master plan at the time was saying, you know what, I'm going to do two years of consulting at McKinsey, then I'm going to go to Harvard Business School, and then I'm going to work at Google. And so it was sort of surreal to sort of see, man, well, I sort of skipped the first two steps and I could go directly there. So I made sure that the work was interesting for sure. And I felt, and I want to make sure that career was going to set the foundation for the other roles that I want to go towards in the future, uh, which thankfully it did. Fantastic. You also worked at a company called Rapid7, and you were there for a year doing business intelligence. Rapid7 is a company, I believe, that provides and I'm getting this from their website, a broad spectrum of solutions for cloud security, vulnerability, risk management, threat detection, and response. And you were doing data analytics with MySQL and data visualization on Domo. I don't know what the heck any of that means, but was this something you had learned in the classroom, Jerry, or did you learn it on the job? 100% on the job. I remember I had gotten my introductory level of learning SQL, which is sort of a data pulling language at my internship at Google. 
I remember I applied to Rapid7 and I was very honest with the team. And I said, listen, I want to grow my SQL skills here. I know the basics so I can do the very basic projects, but I guarantee you, I will learn everything that you need to, that I need to know to take on the bigger projects. And so during my experience there, our team had three categories of projects. They had like the easy one, the medium difficulty one, and the, and the, the harder ones. So I remember I took off the really easy projects, really just tried to make sure I did them in a timely manner. And I made sure that there were none of perfection. After about two months, I moved up, I moved up the ladder, did about, did one medium project and I did a harder project by month five of my time there. And that was to me, again, another reinforcing idea that, Hey, listen, if I sort of set my mind to something and I just keep trying, I keep failing, I keep most importantly, Googling the answers to the problems that I'm facing, I can eventually figure it out. And I remember the project that I worked on was actually seen by the CEO and the CEO actually sent it out to the entire sales team, which was really, really cool. Wow. So to teach yourself how to do MySQL and data visualization on Domo, were you working outside of work hours to learn it? I definitely did spend a little bit of time there, but most of it was on the job. And what was great was I had an extremely supportive team and manager who I felt extremely comfortable with just going up to them and saying, hey, listen, I've tried these six things and I could not figure this out. Can you please help me? And I think that's sort of the difference that uh, that's sort of a way that I built confidence in my team that Jerry will only ask questions after he's gone through the ends of the earth trying to figure it out himself. Or if it's something that is going to take him 10 hours to figure out and answering that question is going to take him five seconds. Yeah. Absolutely. Such a great lesson, though, that you do want to eventually reach out to your manager to get clarification after you have been a self-starter and tried to figure it out on your own for, I don't know, two hours, three hours, something like that. Then you don't want to waste any more time. So you got hired by Google right out of Babson as an analyst in July of 2017. What did that mean? You were an analyst. What were you doing, Jerry? Really was a continuation of my internship where the projects got bigger, the team and the people I was working with got bigger. So really what it came down to it was I was an analyst supporting the engineering team to pull data, consume that data and go, team, we have a product vulnerability here. This is how I believe we should solve for that vulnerability. I would then work with the engineering team, the product team, the legal team to say, listen, we are going to figure out how exactly we're going to do this. Here are my recommendations. And then I would work with the team to actually implement it. So was that using SQL or were you using another software in order to do that? So I was program. Just, it, yeah. Is it the same thing to say software and program? So, okay. All right. Yeah. (laughs) I was uh, using SQL with internal tools. I would then use other internal tools to basically consume that data, visualize it. And then I used Google Suite. So, like Google Sheets, Google Slides, sort of get my results and really present them. And I saw that you got awarded an organization wide gold award. What did that mean? That is a story of the definition of right place and right time. So I remember I was doing this analysis and I remember my manager gave me a really basic task of analyze the market. And I think he was just doing this just to sort of use up my time as I was sort of learning. But what I ended up finding was that there was this one metric that spiked like no other, like in the past 20 years at Google, it had never spiked that high. And I was thinking to myself, this looks funny. And I talked to my colleagues and I'm like, is this normal? They're like, nope, you should absolutely look into it. What it ended up turning out being was it was one of the biggest product loopholes on Google ads. And I spearheaded working with legal, our product, our engineering team. I got them, shepherded the project from start to finish in my first five or six months. And as a result, our VP was like, wow, that I can't believe that this was this had been going on. And so they gave me the award and I was just like, Wow. Right place, right time. You know what, though? I think you were the right person at the right time because 
there may have been someone else, Jerry, that saw that spike and just kept moving on and didn't start asking questions. But you followed up and you ended up like discovering a gold mine. Pretty much. Yeah. And yeah, it's actually funny. I never thought about it that way. I always thought to myself, man, that was just lucky on my part. But you're right. <laughs> you were the right person at the right time. So after 10 months, you were promoted to a strategist from an analyst. Did you ask for that promotion? I know it came in the first performance review cycle and it reflected high impact project execution, which clearly probably came out of that discovery that you made. Yeah. So I remember I had met another mentor around month two or three of my time at Google. And he said, you know what? You have to define what your career success looks like. Is it money? Is it upward mobility? Is it something else? And I said, you know what? I want to be promoted as quickly as humanly possible. And he said, then what you have to do is you have to let your manager know that you want to be promoted, work with them to figure out what are the steps that you need to take for them to feel comfortable. And so when I was going for my first promotion, in my first cycle, I said, listen, I had done this massive project. I have all these other projects in addition to this that make me believe that I'm performing at the next level. I put together a one pager of every project I worked on, the impact that has had, the teams I worked at, so that my manager, when she went into those discussions, she could pull from this and go, oh, what did Jerry do? Well, here, everybody, look at this. And in addition to that, I also had a monthly conversation with my manager where we went through the job ladder of what I needed to do to perform at the next level. I listed out every single project and task that I had. And I said, you grade me on how I was performing. Was I performing at my current level or was I performing at my higher level? And you sort of saw this progression of you were performing at your, for, at your current level for the first few projects. And then you saw that it slowly progressed into the next one. And I said, listen, like, We've been working on this for the past six months together. I feel like we're sort of walking in this direction. And so they apparently, I wasn't part of those discussions, but apparently they had a huge debate about me because it was my first review. They were saying maybe Jerry got lucky, but I think they saw a potential in me, uh, thankfully. And uh, that's what happened. Amazing. So what did you do as a strategist that was different from an analyst? To be honest, it was so, the role was very similar. And that's one of the things I realized was like, man, well, this feels like the work is the exact same. The only thing that has changed is now the bar has gone up. And so for me at that point, I was like, hmm, maybe I feel like my learning curve is steepening a little bit. Let me go ahead and start looking internally, which is how I eventually landed into being a strategy and operations manager role in a strategy team. In a okay. Strategy. Did you ever experience imposter syndrome, Jerry? 100% every time. Every team I've been on at Google, and I've been on two teams, I have been the youngest by two, three, four years. Everyone else around me, they went to Harvard, they went to Stanford, they worked at Goldman Sachs, they worked at McKinsey. And I'm over here twiddling my thumbs and going, hey, I graduated college a year ago. So Absolutely. I always felt like I had a chip on my shoulder. I always felt like I felt super uncomfortable talking about my age because I didn't want people to go, you're only 23. Whereas everyone else was mid in their career. And so I absolutely felt that. But if there's anything that has helped me was just having champions in my team in those conversations where someone was going, Hey, Jerry, Jerry has this great idea. I want to hear him. Jerry, do you want to, do you want to pull up your slides? Having those people absolutely helped me feel like, yeah, I'm young. Yeah. I may not have as many experience, but I deserve to be here. I belong and have a seat at the table. So without those champions in my life, no way I could have done any of this. How did you get the champions? The champions? I think it's just being honest to people that you trust on your team or even outside your team and saying, Hey, listen, I would love for you to mentor me. These are the areas that I want to grow in. And this is why I believe you are the perfect person to help me get there. I would love if you could meet on a monthly or biweekly basis where you can have maybe help coach me and shape me to be following in your similar footsteps. And the thing for me is I 
looked at every person and I said, there's that person has amazing analytical skills. I want to be mentored by the analytical, that their analytical skills. That person is really great at project management. I want to learn how to do project management. That person is extremely good negotiating with stakeholders. I want to be mentored by them. So it's not that I had a one size fit all, but I sort of pick and chose the skills that I saw that I was like, wow, I need to be like them. Took them on to be my mentors. And inevitably they saw the amount of growth that I had, which gave them the confidence. Yeah, Jerry deserves to be here. You are a sponge. (laughs) That's where you are, you're a sponge. I just take people's ideas. (laughs) After seven months, you were promoted to strategy and operations manager. And then a year later, you were promoted to senior strategy and operations manager. You had been at Google at that point for three years and two months, and you jumped ship. You went to Lucid to work as a manager of project strategy and analytics. Why did you want to leave a company like Google? You know, that's that's a million dollar question. And it really just boils down to me feeling like a small, small cog in a big machine. And as much as I felt like I was learning, as much as I felt like the coworkers were pushing me, it never felt like the work I was doing truly mattered. And so I said to myself, listen, I'm not I don't want to go to another Facebook. Google, LinkedIn, Microsoft for my next role. I want to go towards a mid-sized company because hopefully at a mid-sized company, it has all the resources of a bigger company, but I have the impact that I was looking for. And so I moved to Lucid where I led a team of three analysts. And funny enough, one of the analysts was actually older than me. So there's a little bit of a weird dynamic there, but that experience really gave me the perspective of man like, the work that I do, I remember my first month there, I had been asked to prepare a presentation to CEO, which was something I would have never seen at Google. Yeah, for sure. So in the background, at the same time that you were at Lucid, maybe actually it was while you were still at Google, but right around this time, you made a friendship that started off on LinkedIn and it turned into a business relationship. Can you tell us how that happened? Because this is the story of what became Juan Sulting. That's exactly right. Similar to how I got to Google, I wish I had the sexy story, but it really just started with us getting connected on LinkedIn. Jonathan reaching out saying, hey, I listen, I'd love to move to the Bay to work at a tech company. I said, hey, listen, I'll help you give you a referral. This is sort of what I've done. Hopefully this helps. He eventually moved up to the Bay Area And we got asked to do a guest lecture at UC Berkeley about professional development. And what had happened after that was we both posted a photo from that event on our LinkedIn's three more schools reached out and we're like, whoa, that's weird. We did the same thing again. And then after each of those three posts, two more schools reached out. So we had a total of six and it just kept going on and on. And so for about five or six months, John, Jonathan and I, we would be traveling around to do workshops for schools in Canada, schools in University of Michigan and Boston and Texas and Cal- all over California in Seattle. So it was, it was quite interesting to see how much demand there was, not only from our LinkedIn, but also doing these workshops. And later people started asking us, Hey, can you guys review my resume? I'll pay you. We're like, Pay? Sure. Uh, $20. I, I, and I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is just going to be lunch money. And they were like, only 20? I mean, okay, sure. And I was like, hey, do we charge so low? And, and so that's sort of how one Sultan came about. It was that people kept asking and we were like, sure, here you go. And that's sort of the philosophy that we have if you sort of think about building the business is that we don't want to build something that nobody wants. We only want to build something that actually people are dying for. They're like, oh my gosh, I need this. Which is why we've created TikToks, LinkedIn, the 20, our online course service. Everything has been as a result of people asking us. How are you applying the skills that you developed working at Google and Lucid in building one Sulting? Because as you and I both know, Jerry, one of 
I think the biggest ahas that our young listeners who are still in school can get is the fact that no matter what their major is, they are building transferable skills. The transferable skills, I feel like, has really helped shape one's ultimate to where it is today are really two things. One is we, we have a principle that we talk about a lot internally where we go, debate internally, champion externally. I want our teams to be the ones to say, I, I think we can do this differently. Oh, have we thought about this? Because I don't want to launch something for people to say, well, Jerry, well, why, why is it like this? Why is it like that? I want us to be the biggest sort of challenges of our product and our services that we have so that then we deliver something that we feel extremely confident in. And that's something that I learned at Google where we questioned each other like no other, but we did it with, from a place of wanting to make each other better. And the second thing that I've learned is just working with people. Like I didn't realize how much you have to prioritize people in building a company and sometimes even above the work that they're doing. Like you just need to be super sensitive to how people are reacting in meetings. If they're not talking, being, well, well hey, X, I, I, I would love to get your thoughts. What do you think? Making sure you're inclusive. These are the things that I felt like I got a little glimpse in because I saw my manager do them so well that I'm now deploying so sort of same skills that I've seen onto my team. What about any of your strategy and analytical experience? Are you using that? 100%. One of the things that I taught, I, t- I teach and instill my leadership team is it's so easy to be to plan week by week, but I force my team to plan three, four months ahead. Every department, every team has a roadmap that they are working to. And if something changes, the roadmap is a source of truth. So that's where sort of that business strategy comes in. this, And the analytics is something that we are using significantly more now. We are using data to help drive the decisions of how we should continue moving our business. If there's a question of, well, hey, should we think about launching a new service? The question I'll have is, cool. well, how many people actually want it? So being able to have those data-driven conversations absolutely is something that I prioritize. Definitely not to the depth of what we did at Google because that was a whole layer of just just making sure we had the right decisions. But we're definitely scrappy. We're definitely doing what we can with the resources that we do have. So take us into just very quickly what you are doing now as the chief operating officer. You mentioned the various teams that you have, how big is OneSulting? So OneSulting, we have a team of, I believe we are at 17 now. Wow. So across sales, product, marketing, partnerships, and our program management team. So we really are across the entire board, which is to me, as we we're talking earlier before this call, like we are building something like this is actually something now, <laughs> which is crazy. And as I sort of think about my day to day, the key thing I always think about is what are the numbers that matter across the business and what are we doing to actually move those numbers? Revenue, uh, the number of people that we reach, the number of people that we get job offers, how long it takes for us to get them job offers. Those are the things that I always think on a day to day. And I always think, are we working on those things to help move those numbers? And if they aren't, well, why are we working on them? Mm, That is great. I read another post that you made the other day on LinkedIn, Jerry, and you said, I don't wake up at 5 a.m. to meditate. (laughs) You're laughing. I wake up at 10 a.m. I don't work seven days a week. I work three days. I don't listen to Gary V's podcast while I Peloton before I drink my vegan high protein kombucha. I work out at my home gym. As an entrepreneur, I feel this weird pressure to always be grinding, especially while I'm young. Hustle while you're young. Go after it. You can sleep when you're dead. Nah, I'll wake up at 10 a.m. I'll do three-day work weeks. How much of that was kind of playing to the crowd? And how do you think your team would feel to know (laughs) that you're only working three days a week? Yeah, there's definitely some level of fluff in there, um, but those principles hold true. 
my team knows that I do not wake up before I do not do meetings before 10 a.m. That is absolutely a no go. I don't allow my team to book meetings on Tuesdays or Thursdays because those are the days where I get to do my errands. I get to do. And if I have extra time, then, of course, I'm going to dedicate that time to doing work heads down time. And I encourage my team to do the same, that if there are days that you just want to not work or at least have that freedom and flexibility to do other things. And as long as you're delivering on your projects, what difference does it make to me? So, but in actuality, I definitely think about work 24 seven and whether or not I want to, it never escapes my mind, but I definitely try to have that clear separation between sort of work and life. Cause for me, like, as I sort of think about my life and sort of the, the way I have my work set up today, if someone were to give me a hundred million dollars tomorrow and go, Jerry, what are you going to do differently with your life? I would say I would do exactly the same thing. Maybe I'd get a bigger place. I don't know. <laughs> and hire somebody to do the accounting. Oh my goodness, please. <laughs> so two final time for coffee questions. Sure. Could you share a time in your professional life when you struggled? You've definitely been a hustler. You've definitely worked super hard. But have you ever really failed in a job-related task? And if you could share how you persevered and if there was a lesson that you learned in the process. You know, two examples come to mind. And I'll choose a more recent example because I feel like this is this impacted me significantly more. I think once COVID hit, we had sort of been all remote first. And for me, I'm very extroverted. I love seeing people in the office. I love whiteboarding. And so when we sort of transitioned into a workforce environment, it sort of forced me to go, whoa, like I definitely need to change my working style. As I was sort of going through that transition period, I noticed myself being very anxious. I would pick up on like small nuances and conversations and overthink things and go, whoa, does that person really not like the work I did? Or I would have these sort of thoughts. And because I was so used to just seeing people tapping them on the shoulder and mixed in with sort of my upbringing of, you don't want to bother people, right? Like everyone's doing their own work. Just, just do as much as you can before you ask for help. It sort of made me feel like, I wasn't in control of sort of the work I was doing. I wasn't in control of the deliverables that I'm outputting. And I remember there's one project where I just overthought every little nuance. And we had told our VP that we were going to deliver this project as part of a three quarter plan. And because I had pretty much overthought everything, I did nothing for that quarter. It delayed us and we had to have a pretty difficult conversation with the executive because this is one of our biggest priorities. And so as a result, it made me feel like, man, maybe my my manager no longer trusts me as much. Maybe as a result of COVID, maybe I'm just not going to perform as well. I got severe work anxiety where I wake up feeling paralyzed. And, and I felt like I was sort of on a downward spiral. But thankfully... I had the resources to reach out to a therapist. And by the way, I am a huge fan of therapy. I believe everyone should, no matter who you are, no matter how great you're feeling today, you 100% should talk to a therapist once a year, just like you go to a doctor for your physical health. To me, that was everything. Feeling of two things. One, reaching out for help when I need it. And I don't always have to go through the ends of the earth and do everything myself before I reach for help. Sometimes it's okay to reach for help before I get to that point. And the second thing I've learned is that there needs to be a separation between work and my personal life. And for me, I struggle with that a lot because I've been so focused on making sure I do well in my career that I deprioritize sort of what made Jerry, Jerry. So that point in my, in my career, which I felt like was probably one of the lower points, but I took those learnings and I sort of incorporate that in my lifestyle today where I'm like, you know what? I will not have meetings before 10 a.m. I will stack my meetings on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And Tuesdays, Thursdays are my more relaxed days where I can do amazing podcasts like this. So it was sort of a very dark time for me. But as a result of this, I took those learnings and I'm like, now I have created the ideal life that works for me. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Jerry. You are so wise. You really are. I mean, 
you have the wisdom of somebody who is decades older. <laughs> you really do. You're just such an incredible young man. And I, too, am a huge proponent of having a therapist. I've actually seen a therapist on and off for like 13 years. Yes. It is such a gift that yes. you give yourself to start really unpacking maybe some of your idiosyncrasies. You know, we're so close to ourselves, right? We are. We're surrounded by ourselves day and night. It's great to meet with somebody who isn't a relative, who isn't a friend, who has some kind of emotional connection to you, who can give you really that outsider's perspective and expert guidance to help you through some of the challenges that you're going through in your life. 100%. And, you know, this is one of the things I wish I learned earlier in my career, where just talking to a therapist and just doing a, even just doing a check-in is absolutely amazing because I think their mental health isn't something that I feel like didn't come to a priority for me and a lot of my friend groups up until COVID hit. And that's where people really began to realize, man, I really need to take care of myself mentally. And it's so hard to know when maybe things aren't going as well because you can't see it. It's not anything that is physically seen. You have to feel it. And so, yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. So final question. If you could go back to Babson and do it all over again, but based on the incredible wisdom you have now, Jerry, what advice would you give yourself? There's one thing I would do differently is in my, in my college career, the biggest thing I optimized for was GPA. I was like, you know what, whether or not GPA matters, I don't want that to be a variable in my candidacy for, for roles. And as a result, I did not take classes I thought were the most interesting. I took classes that I knew I could do well in. And knowing what I know now, I wished I took classes that spoke to my other interests outside of just work and outside of, of this. Like, I wish I took classes more on, on history. Like, I feel like one of the areas that I am very not well versed in is, is history. But I know I understand how important it is. But as a, because I knew that I wasn't good in it, I knew I was going to get a bad grade. So therefore, I never took those classes. But I wish I did. I wish I took college as more of a learning experience, not a pure mathematical equation for my career. And you could also argue that, hey, listen, maybe your career might have turned differently. I That could be true. But I wish I took those risks because I feel like I sort of have a craving to go maybe take community college courses to take a lot of the courses that like psychology really interests me. I wish I took a class on psychology when I was in college. So though, at least those are the things that I wish I did, that college is more than just getting a job. Well, you can certainly understand why Jerry has been called out by LinkedIn as the top voice or one of the top voices for tech in 2020 and why he has so many followers on LinkedIn. You are definitely going to want to follow Jerry for sure. He puts all kinds of really interesting, valuable content out there on LinkedIn, on TikTok, and on IG. And just let people know what your handles are on, on TikTok and IG. Sure. My handles are Jerry J. H. Lee on Instagram and TikTok. I post everything about my learnings, my career content, the most up-to-date job search process. So if you're looking for a job or looking to move up in your career, I'll see you there. Jerry, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. You are truly an extraordinary young professional, and I wish you nothing but continued success as you and Jonathan continue the incredibly important mission of One Salting. Andrea, thank you so much for having us on here. It is an absolute pleasure to get to know you and share my story. More importantly, I am just a huge fan of the work that you do here. And you have definitely earned a long time, a, long, a lifelong subscriber. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. 
And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.